shop and a payroll deduction of dues provision, which are basic articles in any union contract. And they still have not agreed to a recognition article. Throughout 2016, instead of good faith bargaining, USIC preferred to pin their hopes on instigating a decertification campaign aimed at getting rid of CWA as the workers' bargaining representative. But in February 2017, the workers voted to keep CWA as their union, rejecting decertification. Despite 11 bargaining sessions since the decertification vote and an overall total of 25 bargaining sessions, the company still refuses to budge on the critical issues which concern workers the most. Paid time off, on-call scheduling, holidays, and compensation. The only conclusion we can draw is that because USIC is so deeply anti-union, with the chairperson of USIC's committee, which the chairperson of USIC's committee has conceded and even touted their victories against the union in Pennsylvania and North Carolina, they are obstinately refusing to grant any improvements in the wages and working conditions of its New York Metro workforce in order to preempt interest in unionization among its 7,300 other workers across the country. This is union busting, pure and simple, and it is unacceptable in our city. USIC workers perform important tasks that are vital to the health and safety of all New Yorkers. Before any company digs up a street in New York City and Long Island, USIC workers survey underground infrastructure like gas mains and electrical lines. They then mark the street so that digging doesn't cause electrical outages or even worse, gas main explosions. If this work is not performed correctly, residents are put in grave danger. Starting pay is $15 an hour, and it is $15 an hour only because of an agreement we negotiated with USIC right after the DSERT vote. When the workers joined CWA, the starting wage was between $12.50 and $13 per hour. As of May 2017, less than 5% of the locate technicians in the bargaining unit were earning more than $25 an hour, with the top earner making $28.63 an hour. That means 95% of the bargaining unit is earning less than $25 an hour, hardly an adequate wage in this area. There is tremendous turnover because wages and working conditions are so substandard. We have asked for guaranteed across the board increases for all workers of less than 3% with an opportunity to earn more based on USIC's metrics. But USIC insists that all raises must be merit-based, not guaranteed. The second major issue is paid time off. In the first year of service, New York City and Long Island workers receive a total of five paid days off, vacation and sick leave combined. They get those days only because the company is subject to the New York City Earned Sick Days Law, the provision of which the company extended to the Long Island workforce. Elsewhere in the country, unless it is required by law, first-year USIC workers receive zero days paid time off. In year two, USIC workers receive a total of six paid days off. And in years three through two nine, they receive a total of 12 days off. We have demanded that workers with more than 12 months of service be able to accrue up to three additional paid days off each year, accrued in the same manner that PTO is currently accrued. The company has counterproposed that workers with 12 to 24 months of service can accrue two hours of paid time off for every 100 hours of overtime they work. In other words, they would get one additional paid day off for every 400 hours of overtime worked. That's 30 hours of overtime every week for three months just to accrue one additional paid day off, and there is no guarantee that you will be offered overtime. The lack of paid time off is compounded by the requirement that workers spend 24 hours on call, ready to report to work within, 20, in, within two hours, on the weekends, and are also required to be on call overnight during the week. 
USIC offers no additional compensation for being on call. This requirement is extremely unfair. It is disruptive to the workers' families' lives. It interferes with the workers' ability to get a good night's sleep. It means that when workers do report, they may not be at their best, and that poses a danger to the residents of New York City. It appears that USIC does not care if workers report to the job when they're sick or exhausted, which shows a real disregard for the well-being the, the well of our city. Finally, USI workers receive only six paid holidays. By way of contrast, when New York City municipal workers negotiated their very first citywide collective bargaining agreement in 1969, nearly half a century ago, they received 11 paid holidays. We have asked for one additional holiday, but USIC has flatly refused and has proposed to give an additional holiday only to those employees who have not had any at-fault damages in the prior 12 months. The truth is, not a great deal separates us from reaching a settlement with USIC. We are not looking for enormous changes. We simply want to negotiate a measure of improved wages and working conditions for a group of workers who perform extremely important tasks in our city. We recently became aware of one possible explanation for USIC's determined anti-union behavior. It appears that Partners Group, the private equity firm which recently bought USIC, may be working with a firm connected to Trump Education Secretary Betsy DeVos. The DeVos family's private equity firm recently set up two holding companies that appear to be associated with the acquisition of USIC. The Voss's firm has a history of working with the Partners Group, and Betsy DeVos has reported substantial income from Partners Investments. We are very concerned that a Trump-associated, anti-union billionaire family appears to be part of this deal. The DeVos family is a conservative mega-donor that gave more than $44 million to the Michigan Republican Party GOP legislative committees and Republican candidates between 1997 and 2014, largely with the goal of destroying unions. Betsy DeVos has been at the helm of the family's conservative crusade with her husband Dick. In one case, she contributed $125,000 to a campaign to block union rights in Michigan in 2012 and left that detail off her disclosure forms when she was nominated for Education Secretary. We call on partners to end any partnership with the DeVos family in the ownership or management of this company. Even more important, partners itself should, pay a should play a constructive role in reaching a positive resolution in the bargaining that addresses workers' key concerns. Not only partners must be held accountable for the anti-union behavior of USIC, the primary companies that contract with USIC are two giants of the utility sector here in New York and nationally, Con Ed and National Grid. We urge you to pressure these regulated entities to ensure that they are only contracting with responsible employers who treat their workers with the respect and dignity, dignity those workers deserve. Con Ed and National Grid should not be contracting out with companies that pay substandard wages and which do not seem to care at all about the health and safety of their employees, let alone the public. Members of the Council, we need your help in protecting the wages and working conditions of these workers. We deeply appreciate your willingness to call this hearing today to investigate what is happening in this dispute, and we are grateful that you have indicated to USIC management your willingness to consider legislation that addresses some of the key issues that I've discussed here today. We need to send a message to USIC management today loud and clear that their treatment of workers is unacceptable in New York City. Management needs to understand that in New York City, we have a commitment to fair collective bargaining and fair treatment of workers. This council, with its enactment of earned sick days and fair work week legislation, has signaled its clear commitment to these values. We need you to do this again in this instance. Thank you for your time, and I can answer any questions you may have. Thank you for your testimony. Is there, any, is there anyone else who has testimony to offer at the panel? Great. 
Good afternoon, members of the committee. My name is Harold Perez, and I'm a former USIC employee. I have been a locate technician for seven years, the last three as an employee of USIC. However, on October 20th, 2017, I was terminated by USIC allegedly for violating <clears throat> company's attendancy policy. I don't think it was a coincidence that my termination took place only eight days after I attended the press conference held on City Hall steps about USIC's mistreatment of their employees. The union has filed unfair labor practice charges with the National Labor Relations Board and my case is currently under investigation. We're quite certain that USIC retaliated against me because of my union activity. <clears throat> Since being fired, I've been up, unable to get another job despite having applied at four different companies. I'm using up my retirement savings to pay bills. I, along with my coworkers, voted to join the union December of 2015 for a variety of reasons. I would like to highlight the main ones. The wages we receive are substandard for the important work that we perform. I like to take I take responsibility of protecting USIC's customers' infrastructure and the public safety very seriously and would like to be compensated accordingly. We are the people who make sure when our streets are dug up, your neighbors are protected from gas main explosions, electrical or phone outages. We care about the people of New York City and Long Island. Unfortunately, it doesn't seem that USIC shares our concerns. They certainly don't care about their workforce. I am sometimes required to be on call for 24 hours straight on the weekend, and also several times a month from the end of my shift in the evening until the start of my next shift in the morning. I receive no additional compensation unless I respond to an emergency. Being on call like this makes it impossible to get a decent, a decent night's sleep. It also totally interferes with making plans with my family. When you're on call, you don't relax. It's not like having a real day off at all. There should be some type of compensation for us being on call for the company <clears throat> all through our supposed time off. I only get a total of 11 uh, paid days off a year, combined sick time and vacation time. If I happen to get sick during the year, it leaves me little or no time for vacation. Additionally, the company strongly encourages us to use PTO when there is inclement weather that prevents us from working. This further erodes the, the amount of time that I have to spend with my family. This is New York City in 2017. We deserve the right to take time off when we're sick and we deserve the right to have vacation with our families. USIC's paid time off policies are like going back in time before there was even a labor movement. It's outrageous. Between the substandard pay, the on-call requirements, and the lack of paid time off, it makes it very difficult to raise a family in New York if you're an employee of USIC. Unfortunately, it seems that USIC cares about its executive paychecks and profits for their private equ equity owners. We need a help in pushing back on USIC to negotiate for a fair contract. Thank you for your time today and showing interest in pressuring USIC to treat their employees like me more fairly. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Yeah, this is definitely a, a union town, and we take protecting workers very seriously, and this council has taken it uh, protecting workers very seriously. Uh, so one of the first questions I have are, there are numerous UIC, USIC workers coming out of how dangerous their work is. Uh, can you describe some of the conditions that the workers are, are put in? Day in and day out, uh, there are safety concerns that surround my job. It's pretty much like walking into a, a pit full of sharp objects, cars, construction zones, people. And that's being compounded by the time that we spend out there working. It makes it more difficult to stay focused on safety. And, you know, you, it's more, you're more focused on just being around than actually focus on your safety because they pressure you to work so much. 
So, and what sort of training do you go through in order to uh, do this work? Usually, uh, the trainees do two weeks to a month with uh, just someone in corporate that uh, teaches them the book knowledge, and then they come out to the field and they spend time with a field technician, and uh, they determine whether they're ready based on that uh, evaluation that the employee gives of them. Do you think that there can be better training and safety precautions to protect workers? Most definitely. What sort of things do you think that uh, USIC should be doing to protect their workers? Um, they should definitely be doing a lot more hands-on training on the field rather than uh, giving a normal employee the responsibility of finishing up the training. There should be uh, someone from management to fine-tune these employees in the end, at least to get the safety down packed. And when it's, when it's in inclement weather, as you talked about, they encourage you to take time off? or how, how, you show up Walk me work, through that a little bit more. You show up for work at 7 in the morning, and it's snowing already, and it was forecast to snow for the rest of the day. So they say today is going to be a slow day. Say there's a group of eight. Six of the people get sent home. Two of them stay to cover emergencies. The six people that get sent home are uh, they're pushed to take PTO. Don't forget to put in your PTO for the day that you had off, you know, even though you were sent home, not so, you, so you, you're saying that if you're sent home, they're requiring you to take off, take your paid time off yes. in order to be sent home. They're definitely suggestive, suggestive, suggestive yeah. of it, or they tell you you're not going to get wow. paid because of it. Wow. Yeah. That's egregious. So just, just one class. So that they, they encourage you to use the PTO so that you don't have any left. If you don't use your PTO time, then you don't get paid. So you don't get paid? You don't get paid, no. So you, it, I'm sorry, John Dempsey, CWA so, staff representative. So the choice is if you'd like to get paid, you have to take a day off. If you have a paid day off, if you don't, if, but they're sending you home. If, if they send you home, you're not getting, getting paid for the day. That's correct, counsel. That's beyond egregious, beyond egregious. Uh, I mean, what are, the tradi what are the other general labor standards in the industry? Uh, I can't, I, I, I can't answer that question. I, I will tell you, uh, what USIC has been doing is, is going around and buying up smaller located <clears throat> companies and then, and then, uh, enforcing their horrible conditions on them. Um, they did this to a company that I believe was Eastern Locating Services in Pennsylvania. Um, they bought them up. They were CWA represented locators. They came in and destroyed the contract to the point that CWA could never get that contract ratified and we lost the unit. Um, so I, I don't know if I answered your question in any way, mm -hmm. but um, it's high turnover, uh, tremendous amount of high turnover. <coughs> We went from 130 employees to 180 just in the last six or seven months. So they got 50, 50, 60 new employees out there that don't have the experience protecting the public uh, because they keep losing. They 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 keep losing all their experienced locators because they're just not doing the right thing. I, well, because yeah, yeah, they're, they're fed up. They they <clears throat> we've had a couple of them actually apply for jobs in Verizon because Verizon actually is hiring right now, so. And what other companies are in, in this line of work that are not owned by USIC? We actually, um, my name is Keith Purse. I'm yeah, the Keith. president of Local 1101 CWA. Mm -hmm. uh, we actually represent uh, people that do this line of work also in the Bronx and Manhattan mm -hmm. for, uh, for Verizon Telephone. Right. And anybody else who wants to use that, like uh, Spectrum or Cable Altice, any of those in the Bronx and Manhattan only, though. So we represent them, and they have a very good wage, good benefits, pension, uh, everything that you should have when you work in New York City or anywhere else in this country. And they all do very well, and they do the same exact work, but they're rewarded for it, and they get to work in a safe environment with a good wage. So that's where I was going. That was my next question, is that there is a, a huge disparity here between what is being paid by 
other similarly situated workers. Empire City Subway is the name of the organization. Empire, and, and, and USIC. Mm -hmm. uh, and then how, how is traditional, uh, uh, non-traditional work being addressed uh, when it comes to pay equity? Can you say that question again? Uh, how is pay equity and non-traditional work uh, being addressed? I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Hmm? Are, are, are there, when it comes to gender, are, there, are men and women being paid the same? Is there, is there an issue with uh, gender equity? I have not noticed any issue with gender equity. There are, okay. there are, there are very few female uh, employees that are, are there. Um, so I have not, I, there, I have not seen any gender equity. I, I think it's fair to say, uh, council member, that um, both men and women are uh, treated equally unfairly. Yeah, they're, they're, they're both, yeah. both genders are being treated poorly. Yeah. Okay. Uh, at this juncture, I will uh, pass some of these questions off to my colleagues. Uh, first, uh, Council Member, I think that um, President Peirce was uh, hoping to make a statement. Oh, okay. I, yeah. I, I, I was unaware about it. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> Good afternoon, uh, committee. My name is Keith Peirce. I'm the president of CWA Local 1101. Uh, all, of the, all that these USIC workers are looking for is a fair and equitable contract, a decent pay, and a safe work environment. Democracy shouldn't just be about the right to vote. It should also give people the right to good-paying jobs, safe jobs, so they can raise their families, buy a home, and send their kids to good schools and get a good education and go further. But right now, we have a president who would rather give corporations a 15% tax cut, corporations like USIC that have no intention to pass anything down to their workers unless they are forced to, unless they are forced to give them good pay, unless they are forced to give them safe work environments, unless they are forced to stop keeping them on 24-hour calls for, for all weekend when they can't get any sleep, and then they go out there either sick or tired and put people in danger. And that's not what we should be doing. Now, I know this city council has done a lot to help workers in New York City. And I ask you, I urge you to help these USIC workers get the fair wage and be able to work in the safe environment they deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you, President Person. My apologies, I, did, I wasn't certain that you wanted to testify. Uh, with that, I will, I will turn it over to Councilmember Lander, followed by Councilmember Drum. Uh, super, thank you. And, and with, perm with permission, Chair, maybe I'll do like a first draft. Some questions about the conditions and about the bargaining, and then some questions about legislation we might do, but maybe I'll do a first round and, and let Danny go and then come to a second round. Um, thank you for being here. I'm so sorry that you have to, and it's obviously appalling that the company, you know, so ashamed of its record that they wouldn't even come talk to us about it. We've seen a lot of employers who we thought were not treating their workers fairly. Most of them had the decency to the city council to come and tell their side of the story. Um, a company that doesn't even come when called to the city council to tell their side of the story is, is really saying something. And Mr. Perez, I want to especially thank you for, for being here. And you know, I think we feel implicated here. I, you know, we met you out on the porch of this building when you came to tell your story, an act of political free expression and protected labor organizing. Um, and the fact that it seems that that cost you your job is an unfair labor practice, but it's also an affront to this body and this building. And I just want you to know that we uh, are angry about it and we'll look to have your, your back and the, and the backs of your fellow uh, former coworkers. So thank you. Um, I just want to make sure I understand what the work is and why you guys are doing it rather than Con Ed and National Grid. So just wa walk me through, I know you said a little bit of in your testimony, but just explain to me what, kind of what's going on here, what, what's the kind of work that's happening above ground and, and what you guys are doing and why it's important. So the best way I could describe, if you heard of 811 call before you dig, so this doesn't only apply to contractors who may be laying new conduit through the streets. It applies to a homeowner who may be putting a fence up in his yard. You, you are required to call 811 before you dig. 
Um, there's a nationwide 811 system that would generate a ticket, and then that ticket would be sent to uh, to the companies that perform the locating services. So if you were a contractor that wanted to lay pipe in the street to run another cable through there, uh, you would have to call 811 before you dig. The 811 system would create a ticket, uh, and it would go to USIC to identify existing underground facilities, whether they be electrical, gas, or cable vision, or cable, excuse me, cable TV, cable TV wires. And that way, when they do, when the contractor does come to lay the pipe or the conduit to run a new, new uh, line through there, you don't damage the old stuff that's underneath there. Um, just, and, you know, so Verizon workers do this work ourselves. Uh, we have not, as CWA, we have fought the contracting out of this work to preserve our jobs with, you know, good union jobs with Verizon. Uh, it seems to me Con Ed and National Grid have chose a different path that they could get this work done a lot cheaper without their own people, and that's why they contracted out. I mean, I assume there was a point in time at which National Grid and Con Ed did this work in-house like Verizon did. I don't know if you know that. I wouldn't, but be, able to, I, I wouldn't be able to speak on that. No. All right. Well, we should, I'm disappointed also that National Grid and Con Ed aren't here. We also invited them, and we will surely be following up with them because the questions I wanted to ask were about this, knowing that Verizon does it, knowing that it's critical to the safety of their workers as well as the security of their lines. Um, my hunch, I, we won't know because they're not here today, is they used to do it in-house, um, that that meant they paid people according to their pay and benefits package and that they realized that they could pay people less they, you know, by, by sweating it to, to USIC. To, to the best of my knowledge, National Grid still does do some of this in-house. So they do have locate, they do have, you know, employees that do this type of work also. Okay. Now, I mean, I was not familiar, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not, with 811, it, to me it sounds like the kind of thing that would be a public or municipal service, I mean, you know, obviously we both want to not have people's cable cut off, like this is both a convenience issue, we don't want their cable to cut off, a public safety, you know, uh, you know obviously we, we preserve electricity, but if you hit a gas line, you could have, a, you could have an explosion here. So. It's, it's critical public safety work, but it's not handled by a city or state func eight, three, 311 is a New York City function. 911 is a New York City function. 811, you're allowed to connect it to worker, to, to a contractor that employs workers with essentially no wage or safety or benefit standards at all. That, I can't tell you exact how, how it works, but... Um I know it's it's part of the law that you have to call before you dig, you know. So uh, then, I mean, it's good. Work? I guess we made it part of the law that you have to call before you dig. It seems like we should have made it part of the law that the workers that are coming to protect us when you call before you dig are covered by some of the same standards. Yeah. I mean, and I'll be honest, we'll get to this in a minute. But like, we covered fast food workers to not have on-call scheduling, which I want to ask a little more about in a minute. But I. You know, so like I'm angry at Con Ed and, and National Grid and obviously at, at USIC, but I, I do think there's sort of like some public responsibility here. This is not a a private function, right? These these this is a this is a public need a public necessity to perform this work. Correct. To give you uh, some perspective on why they outsource to contractors, they use it as a way to play past the buck. So when something goes wrong, the liability now gets split into thirds instead of in half. Con Ed would have half of the liability and the contractor digging would have half the liability if they marked it. But now that we marked it, if something's wrong with the marks, they can now blame us and charge our company rather than paying for it themselves. I bet they're paying more for their insurance policy than they are for their workers. Um, anyway, let me ask one just question about the on-call, and then I'll, I'll uh, turn it over to Danny and come back with a few questions uh, after that. So, you know, on-call is this thing that exploded in, in recent years, like it didn't used to be, you know, obviously there are 
workers who are in certain kinds of emergency situations, you know, if there's going to be a big snowstorm, then we have to ask sanitation workers to be ready to work more than they work when there isn't a snowstorm. We compensate them for the different ways that we ask them to be on call or work shifts. So, you know, you can sort of see where it began as a response to certain kinds of emergencies. It then exploded in um, retail and fast food to the point where the Attorney General of the State of New York and then the City Council and the State Wage Board have had to regulate because, um, and I actually I ran into a, a store owner on Fulton Mall who was upset we had ended it because he said, you mean, I, I was trying to understand when he used on call and he basically said, so, but what if it's going to rain? So that was a retail store owner who knows he's going to get fewer customers on a day it rains and so he keeps workers on call so that if it doesn't rain, he can have them in. And if it does rain, he doesn't have to pay them. But obviously, no worker could construct their life where they don't get paid if it rains. Um, but I just, it sounds to me like most of the work here is, is scheduled work, even though this is public safety work. It's, uh, is some of it might be performed in cases where there's sort of a an urgent call, but much of it, it sounds like, probably gets scheduled in advance and, and the company could could schedule the work. Well, uh, and my understanding is that their contracts with the utilities require them to have somebody available to locate for emergencies 24-7. So that's why the on-call piece is there. Interesting. So, so Con Ed is contracting to demand on call work, but then not paying any attention to how it's, I bet Con Ed workers, if they have to have on call shifts, are compensated when they're not. So let me just make sure I understand. So for 24 hours, you wait on call, you get nothing for it. If they don't call you, you don't get paid anything for having been available those 24 hours. And if they do call you, they just pay you straight time without any additional bonus starting at $15 an hour. That's correct, as, unless you have, unless you had already reached your 40 hours during that week. Right. I mean, if you, you wind up getting overtime, but not thanks to the, you know, generosity of USIC, but to the laws of the state of New York. Um, oh, God. Um, okay. Um, I'm going to pause there for a minute. I'm still sitting with that. I'll, I'll yield to uh, my colleagues, and I'll come back and ask a few more questions if they don't, uh, if they don't cover it. Well, thank, thank you, Brad, and thank you, um, oh, I'm to the Costa, to the chair as well, for chairing this uh, hearing. I know that Danique has not been feeling well, uh, and you did a great job in asking a lot of the questions that I was going to ask as well, because I didn't exactly understand the relationship. But one question that I do have is, when um, Parks Department is going to replace trees, would they call, I mean, they have to get an okay from Con Ed first before they can actually replace trees? Would you be the people who would go out and check tree pits to see if there are wires into that? Yes, sir. So you do that work also? Everything. Anytime anyone digs within the city of New York, we get called out. They get called out If they're that. digging legally and they called 811 like they were supposed to. So that's actually a pretty big um, deal because, um, I mean, anytime um, we want to get stuff done here in terms of trees, um, oftentimes that's been a an issue with us and with Con Ed. But um, I I'm just wanted to say, actually, that I'm outraged by this letter from this Cynthia K. Springer, um, that she would write such a ridiculous letter to the city council um, on unfair practices. I mean, I have to wonder how much she's getting paid. And I'm sure she's not getting paid $15 an hour. And I wonder what her benefits are. And I'm pretty sure that she's probably got fairly decent benefits. and and time off and sick days as needed. Um, and, and I'd just like to say, um, I think they're from Indiana, and, um, and, and they just probably don't know that New York City is a union town. And here in New York City, we respect our unions and we support our unions because basically what the unions want is what everybody wants, which are fair wages, compensation, and to be treated fairly and equitably on a job. And from the descriptions that you provided in your testimony, it seems that um, that's the exact opposite of what's happening. I mean, I can't really believe that, you know, people still treat people this way, treat employees this way. I mean, 
I, I don't see how one human being can treat another human being in this fashion, to be honest with you, you know. And then the fact that they, that they wouldn't even come in and testify is just uh, really horrible. Um, of course, I'm the chair of the Education Committee, and I'm finding out that there are many more uh, Betsy DeVos connections in the world, uh, especially under this, uh, this Trump uh, administration. But, you know, it's the rich making the rich richer. And they're forgetting about the average person on the job. And so um, while, um, you know, it is surprising, it's not surprising to see some of the involvement there as well. But we as a council, I believe, will stand in support and united against this type of mistreatment of the workers, especially here in New York City. And um, I mean, I'm just, I, I cannot believe that this is still going on. And I, I just thank you for coming in and providing us with this testimony. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Drum. I uh, would like to acknowledge that uh, Councilmember Crowley and from Queens and Councilmember Cornegy from Brooklyn, both members of the committee, uh, were here as well. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back to Councilmember Lander for his second round of questioning. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm gonna, I guess I want to follow up a little on where Councilmember Drum pushed in this letter just because um, they do uh, indicate that they have, um, oh, I had it written down, offered several creative solutions uh, in the letter in their bargaining. So I just want to dig in a little more on the, on the bargaining side. Um, some of the things you said in your testimony were quite stunning, you know, that, you know, that all they've given on is a funeral leave policy they already had, that they wouldn't negotiate over one additional holiday and that they've shown no flexibility on these just appalling on-call policies. So I, I'm, I'm puzzled to figure out what the uh, create, several creative solutions they've offered. I'm so, curious if you can shed any light on that. I can. So some of them, some of it's in, in the testimony, but, you know, we have three major issues that we want to address during this bargaining. Uh, wages on call and paid time off. Uh, paid time off, you could look at it as two separate things, uh, your PTO and your holidays. Uh, to have only six holidays a year, I, I I've, I've, haven't seen that in my years of bargaining. Um, um, their creative solution to that is that <clears throat> we'll give employees an extra floating holiday if they had no damages in a prior 12 months uh, upon ratification of the agreement. Um, that means you had to be perfect. And they're only given six as it was. Um, in order to reach an agreement, you know, I don't even like what I propose, but we're at, listen, if you had two or less in a prior 12 months, then you get the floating holiday. Um, not, not that you had to be perfect. Um, the wages, they are strictly merit-based on their proposals. Um, we, again, at an attempt to reach an agreement, have proposed across the board. I have the proposal here so I could get the exact number, but I, I think across, across the board, 2.5%, and then a possibility to earn another 2% based on your amount of damages, your safety observations, and your productivity, um, which is what they insisted on being in there. Um, the one other difference, too, is they are only proposing a one-year contract, again, so they could go right into their decertification mode and, and, and try to bust this union here. Uh, we, are, we are asking for a two-year contract, and in the second year of the contract, our wages, again, are a hybrid of across the board and metrics. Um, the pay time off, they've been very clear from day one of the negotiations that they were not going to compensate people for pay time off. They just think it's outlandish that they would have to compensate somebody because they only require them to respond within two hours. So they don't think it's infringing on their day off, which is it's just false. Uh, you know, if, if I wanted to go to the Poconos, I can't. I'm on call. If I wanted to have an adult beverage at a barbecue, I can't. I'm on call. Um, 
So it does infringe on them, and they will not see eye to eye with that. Uh, to comment a little, if you don't mind, uh, about Cynthia K. Springer, um, who wrote the letter for Monta Bowles, uh, who's the VP General Counsel for USIC. Um, for the first year of bargaining, every one of my proposals were rejected. And it wasn't counted. It was a verbal rejection with anti-union re rhetoric intertwined with why she can't do what, she had, what, what we were proposing. Uh, there was no good faith bargaining. Um, our last bargaining session on December 5th, um, I called a sidebar with the federal mediator, the vice president of Local 1101 who sits on, on our committee, myself, Monta Bowles, and, and, and Ms. Springer, just to make sure that they were clear that if they addressed our concerns, and, and obviously my proposals on the table showed them that they didn't have to come all the way to where I was, that there was room, but if they addressed our concerns on these three issues, that we could reach an agreement and, and we, could, we could talk to the council about whether the hearing was necessary or not. Monta Bowles' comment back to me was, we are not afraid of your city council hearing. That was her, her, her comment back. They actually made no comment. And I said, do you have anything to say? And she goes, you don't think we're afraid of your city council hearing, do you? So that, that's the attitude I've been dealing with for two years. Uh, they, um, you know, it's, it's a hard unit to communicate with the members. They home garage. Uh, so it's tough to find a meeting place. Um, another little story, to talk to the members about this hearing taking place. We ran around to their meeting places. They meet in a parking lot on Linden Boulevard behind a movie theater for Brooklyn, and they meet in a New York City public park parking lot in Queens. Um, so we went there to talk to the guys, to let them know that this was going on, to tell them to hang in, to tell them we're working to get you a fair deal. Um, they, at our next bargaining session, pulled the vice president out of the room, and I wasn't there, and were trying to make an argument that we had no right to talk to those employees, our members, because we were calling a union, union meeting and they were getting to the union meeting by driving a company vehicle. And this is us just trying to get there five, ten minutes early to talk to the guys where they convened to get their work. So I'm sorry to go off. No, thank you. I'm there. sorry for your... But uh, I don't... i just trying to uh, tell you the treatment of or their yes. attitude towards the union. Yeah. Their attitude towards their work is at the bargaining table, and they have given us a last, best, and final. Uh, they gave us a proposal on August 28th that had movement to some of these things that they call creative ideas. Um, since then, they have not moved except for, you know, a typo here and a typo there, and now they're on their last, best, and final. Um, some of the other creative things that they think are addressing our concerns is the requirement, uh, the, the um, not requirement, but to accrue extra paid time off by working hundreds of hours of overtime. I mean, I, I, it's outlandish. It's crazy. Um, so um, it sounds like, you know, the, the, the contempt they are showing to, you know, to the workers and, and to the union is, is also being shown to the city council. Um, and I want to just talk a little bit about what I hope we'll uh, will do about it. So, I, um, Sergeant, can you? Um, uh, I can just walk these over. Yeah. Thank you. So, you know, we're at the end of our term right now. We this, we're, we're going to have our final council meeting next Monday. Um, as a result of which, there wasn't um, a lot of time to introduce new legislation and get it sort of developed and through our lawyers and ready for this hearing. And we'd like to have an oversight hearing and understand the situation better before we legislate anyway. 
But we have talked about the possibility of, uh, of some legislation to address these issues, some of which it's clear to me the City Council would have clear authority, some of which we might need to work with our partners in the state legislature. But we, we've banned on-call scheduling for fast food workers in New York City, uh, which I'm proud of. I, you know, and, um, uh, we, I, I'm confident we have the power to ban or, or require extra compensation for, is also really what we did in the case of, uh, of uh, fast food workers. With retail workers, we banned it. With fast food workers, we required some additional compensation for late added hours. Um, it seems to me, we, if we're going to do that for fast food and retail workers, doing it for workers who are pr protecting the public and keeping us safe is a no-brainer. So um, uh, would you work with us as we craft this legislation just to make sure we kind of get it right and, you know, make sure it works in a way that is, uh, you know, would, would work? Well, obviously, we'd be incredibly interested in working as closely as possible with you to uh, address these issues legislatively if we cannot uh, achieve any movement at the bargaining table, and you know, um, the com you know the company may not respect you, but we certainly do, and uh, would welcome your assistance. I think when we pass laws, they you know they are generally <laughs> they may pay closer they, attention when they, they can, when we start having hearings on on legislation. Um, uh, and I think we, you know obviously there are workers m much like your workers who are covered in prevailing wage categories. Um, some of those related to our living wage law at the city, some related to the state labor law, so we could talk to our, our partners at the state. But this issue of safety protocols that really the chair began the hearing on seems to me like the idea that we currently, there are streets, you know, the city streets, and we currently don't, are not concerned that the folks who are mandated through this 811 system uh, to, to dig them up, uh, there's no safety protocols, protection standards, obviously that includes this on-call issue and rest, but it also includes the chair's point at the very beginning of the hearing that there's just n no safety training required. We just passed a, a bill that will make sure that construction workers have a minimum level of safety in order to prevent uh, accidents. Um, that's a, you know, it, it seems to me clear we ought to consider doing something similar for those workers who we're authorizing to dig up the streets. So, um, so even though today's hearing is not yet on those uh, bills, certainly coming out of this hearing, uh, uh, Mr. Chair, I'd love to work with, with you and with uh, Chair Miller and Council Members uh, Drum and Crowley and anybody else who's interested in developing these into legislation we can introduce early in the new term. Um, in the best of worlds, the company will, um, you know, reconsider its bargaining position and work with you guys on a fair contract, and we wouldn't have to move forward legislatively. But it, it doesn't sound like that's the direction it's heading. And I, given what we've heard today, and I feel like the obligation we have to you, Mr. Perez, being fired for exercising your free speech rights on our steps, that I feel the council has a real obligation to move forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Melander, and I, I would be interested in working with you. So, um, just quickly, I have a few more questions before we wrap up. Uh, what sort of, you know, some USIC workers have come forward and, and stated there's a lack of job security. And if, uh, you know, and a lot has to do with relating to Con Edison and National Grid. If you mark the ground and there's a dispute um, over the work uh, but that uh, Con Edison and, and uh, national grid workers do subsequent to you marking the ground, uh, what happens uh, to re in relation to the USIC worker? Uh, uh, can well, I mean, I think if, if, you know, if you mark the ground that the utility pipe is here, and then the, the you know, oh, Con Edison you mean, and national grid then could subsequently goes in and, and there's a dispute as to, you know, maybe they go a little bit too far to the left, or you know, they say that you guys are the ones who marked it in the wrong place. What happens to so, the USIC work? So workers? whenever there is a damage to any utility after one of our members have performed their location of those utilities, there's an investigation, right? We have <clears throat> certain investigators that will go out and and find out what what was the error. You know, did, did we did the guy do it, the job correctly, or was the the prints just incorrect, or whatever? Um, they have categories of damages too: um, high-profile damages, 
which would be gas, you know, uh, usually leads, if you made an error there, usually leads to your termination. Uh, if there are other damages that aren't as high profile, it leads to other disciplinary type action. So what's the liability does Con Edison and, and National Grid uh, uh, hold for USIC workers? The liability? Yeah, I mean, if, if, uh, if some, this is a whole problem, whole pro, uh, high profile incident does occur, right? And they're pointing the finger at USIC workers, in turn, its investigation is done, what, you know, that worker is terminated, right? It, it's. Yes, we've, we've seen people terminated for making mistakes, uh, locating stuff. And what sort of process they go through this, what do you say the investigation, what sort of investigation is done by whom? Uh, there's an actual, uh, the, the guy has an actual title that he's an investigator. Uh, he works for USIC or he I, works? I don't, I, I can't tell you for sure. I could, I could find it out for you and let you know. I believe he works for National Grid. Uh, maybe Harold can help. Um, USIC has a set of in, uh, inspectors that do quality assurance and mm -hmm. National Grid also has their own set of inspectors. Usually when a damage occurs, they meet at the site and they go over it there together. So there's, there's uh, both companies have their hand in disciplinary action at the end so of the So National Grid has a hand in determining who is yes, at sir. fault? Yes. And they may in turn then look to see if, to point the finger in a different direction, right, at, at one of the USIC workers. That's possible, right? Yes. When it comes to training, are there different, I mean, you talked about, you know, a couple of weeks working in the office and then a couple of weeks on site. Um, on the different levels of work, you, from this high profile to the less high profile work, uh, is it the same amount of training? I mean, how does, how does, how does the whole training apparatus work for the um, work? The training goes based on an area, certain areas, like closer to, for example, a power plant, there's going to be a lot more sensitive facilities and high profile things. But if they send you to train in an area that's not near any of those, you might not encounter that during your training. You might encounter that on the field. You might just run across that, you know, after you're already out on your own. So there's a possibility of you not getting trained on these sort of high-profile yes. apparatus and then being called in for an emergency and having to do that work. Yes. They're going to show you the book, the book stuff up until that point, but you might not encounter one hands-on until you get out on your own. So. Uh, it's kind of setting you up in a, in, a, in a bad way then when it comes to training, right? I mean, it's, it's not giving you the, the, the chapter and verse of what you need to be effective for yourself to keep yourself safe and also to keep, you know, the people of the city of New York safe, right? Definitely. And when it comes to, to wages, uh, how does salary and benefits progress uh, within uh, three years or six years? So I don't know if I'm going to be able to answer your specific question. There is no progression table. It's just merit-based raises, right? Um, so prior to the union being there, um, they would grab people in, and Harold, you could probably speak to this, how you got your raises with USIC. They'd bring you in, and they'd just say you're getting another 40, 50 cents an hour, whatever they decided on. Um, there is no progression table. Um, I will tell you, uh, before we reached a, an agreement in, in February of 2017 after the decertification vote, after we won the decertification vote, before that, 66 out of the 132 bargaining unit members were earning $15 or less an hour. Um, only 12 were, owning, were earning above 25, $22.50 an hour. Um, after we reached the agreement on 320, the agreement at the end of February, after that, uh, we had 34 of the people earning the minimum wage, but now 50, 59 people were earning between 1501 and 1750, and 32 were earning between 1750 and 20, 2250. So we had. Um, made a good good some good progress mm -hmm. with that agreement but now today I have to
this here. Give me one second if you don't mind. Now today, 40% of the bargaining unit, again, is earning a minimum of $15 an hour. Um, and this sort of stands in direct contrast, again, to the workers that you've negotiated with Verizon doing very similar work, right, doing the same work, correct. that have uh, baselines that they are getting every year as it comes yeah. to benefits, when it comes to pay, when it comes to pension, correct? Veri yes, Verizon has a five-year, for the, for the employees that perform this type of work for Verizon, they have a, what is called a, a five-year wage progression table, where every six months you'll go up incrementally um, to top pay, which is about $42 an hour. So after five years, you'll be earning $42 an hour doing similar work that, that the USIC employees do. Um, so. That's really all you're asking for, right? Is to be treated fairly. We're not even. And, and, I w I no, wish we're I not asking for anything near that. Right? That anything that, right. right. <laughs> I mean, I think within two and a half years, if we figure out that Verizon employees are making something like $29 an hour. So within two and a half years of being employed by Verizon, everybody who does this work at Verizon is making more than what people who have been 15 and 20 year employees at USIC are making. That is. I want to re come back yeah. to the the the, um, the Con Ed National Grid question for a moment, sure, if I may, absolutely. which is that, you know, our main beef with uh, Con Ed National Grid is that they are deeply implicated in this structure of employment, right? right? They know exactly what they're buying from USIC. They know at this point exactly what USIC is paying, but they disclaim any responsibility. Not our business. We're not the employer. We've just contracted out. But they are publicly regulated utilities with uh, obligations to protect the public with guaranteed rates of return uh, set by uh, statewide regulators, and yet they don't want any accountability for the treatment of these workers. And we just think that's wrong. They obviously could say to their contractor, that's not how we do things in New York. Maybe you do it that way in Indianapolis or Phoenix or, you know, North Carolina or wherever the heck else you operate, but in New York we pay people a living wage. We, National Grid and Con Ed, pay our employees a living wage, although not without some dispute, as we know from several years ago, but, mm -hmm. um, you know, they could, they obviously have a lot of leverage, and so we, you know, really feel disappointed that they didn't bother to show up um, and explain uh, their attitude towards the way in which uh, USIC treats its uh, its workforce. Uh, we share. I, I, you know, Councilman Lander, if I'll allow be allowed to speak for you, I think you've already said this. We we share your disappointment in that. Um, there is an opportunity today to be heard um, by Conison, by Natural Grid, by USIC, um, in a forum, in public, on the record, right? Have the opportunity to have a dialogue with council members, asking questions, right? And. And if, if, if their side of the story is so compelling, why not sit in the chair? Why not have to take the opportunity to be heard and defend themselves and, and, and say, lay out their side of the story in a, this public forum, but again, on the record being sworn in, um, as we do here at City Council hearings, they've uh, taken the opportunity not to do that. And that speaks volumes onto itself, right? So uh, uh, we definitely agree with you in that disappointment today. All right, so I think uh, with that, um, I uh, will thank this panel for your testimony. And we thank you for your support and your interest. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, all right so uh, with that, I want to thank uh, all the members of uh, CW1101 for being here today and your testimony. Uh, we look forward to working with you uh, in ensuring that your members are treated fairly and that, uh, you know, definitely look forward to working with our chair, uh, Idenique Miller, and I wish him a speedy recovery on his back. Uh, thank you, Councilman Merlander, and others who have asked questions today. And again, thank you, Matt Carlin, uh, Kevin Katowski, uh, and uh, you know, Brandon Clark from uh, Council Member Miller's office, as well as Nick Wazowski from my staff. With that, I'll uh, gavel close this meeting of the Civil Service and Labor Committee. <laughs>